Adam, what a pleasure to have you back on our show here. Uh, CPO of Arculus, of course, how are you doing today? How was the travels? How was the holiday seasons? Fantastic, been really busy, been all over the world traveling for Arculus. I was at Singapore FinTech Festival, I was in Germany before that, I got Paris coming up, so it's been great traveling all over the world talking about Arculus. Yeah, now you're in Atlanta, Georgia, which is definitely the best place out of all of those, right? That's well, I'm here with you, so of course. <laughs> of course, of course. But yeah, can you give us a little bit of a, a background just on who you are and what Arculus is? Sure, I'm Adam Lowe. I'm CPO of Arculus and Composecure. Composecure is Arculus' parent company that produces almost every metal payment card in the world. So we produce products for JP Morgan, American Express, federal government uh, with IDs and been around about 20 years. Are they not mad at you at all for building a service that is completely against everything traditional <laughs> banks do? <laughs> no, I mean, they're, they're really happy that we built this great security and identity product, right? So, you know, the same type of chips that live in payment cards is what lives in Arculus. In fact, the same chip that's in the U.S. passport is the chips in Arculus that keep your keys safe. So whether yeah. we're keeping banking keys safe or your crypto keys safe, it's the same cool cryptography. Yeah, definitely. And I, I'm honestly just going to get straight to the point here for a lot of the audience. They're like, oh, another hardware wallet, so another product. So are we going to trust this one again? You know, what separates you guys from all these other wallets? Why should customers trust you? Because this is an underlying broken ethos in the industry where we're supposed to be this trustless man at this trustless base. But if you want good security, if you want a hardware wallet, there is that immediate trust that just comes back inevitably in the space. So how do you guys separate that and how do you guys look at hardware wallets as a just self custody uh, version of itself that you guys provide? Sure. So the first thing is, you know, we really look at our history to help credentialize us, right? So like I said, we produce payment products for the largest banks in the world. There's 20 years of trust there, trust from the federal government producing IDs. We're a publicly traded company, so the level of scrutiny is unimaginable. I had no idea until we went public <laughs> how many forms and audits and all sorts of things we have to go through um, to help keep us safe. You know, it's the same type of security technology that's on IDs and banking cards. There's 15 billion banking cards on the planet. They've never been penetrated. So it's that same level of security and built from the ground up that we really think differentiates us. Cards are yeah. all made in the U.S., all programmed in the U.S., so, um, you know, we think that also has sets a certain bar in quality and standard. You said 15 billion? Payment cards. Payment yeah. cards, wow. And of course, you have like 600 patents. So is that all directly your technology that you've developed? No, I wish. Okay. Um, a lot of the payment cards really, are, and the patents around it really have to do with metal, which we do specialize in. So the patents are around tap to pay and metal, which takes a lot of magic mm -hmm. uh, to make that work. Some of the security software yeah. and all of that to really build that out. So with your guys' card, you know, if, if I'm a user brand into this industry and I come in, I see all the exchanges failing, people getting fired, people getting, you know, sued, people going to jail. And then I see hardware wallets and this topic of not only one of the largest wallets out there, but, you know, having back doors and people worrying about these updates that are going to inevitably come to their blue, tip, blue chip device that they're using. Does Arculus use any of that same mechanism or how does a customer not worry about you guys updating that card and inevitably pushing us out of our own wallets? Sure. So that's really important and a really fundamental difference with Arculus and a really important factor for me. So the first is we don't update Arculus. So for our long customers, we really appreciate it. We had Edition Zero customers that we upgraded for free when we made Edition Two cards. We don't upgrade in the field. The software is into the firmware and that's it. So you're not going to have to worry about some weird update on your card because we don't push updates to the card. So that's an important security feature. The second is we have no way to link your identity with your address and your account. So I don't know that John Smith is 0xff blah 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 blah. We, we literally with a gun to my head there's no way I could do that. There's no way even under subpoena I could give someone keys to the yeah. government because I literally don't have them. That's a huge differentiating factor versus some of the other hardware wallets out there and everybody can do their own diligence. But to me, that is one of the biggest differentiators is we don't have your keys. We can't give them to anyone else. Now, are you guys the only company that does that? Or why are these other hardware wallets doing that? Yeah, you know, they, I think they essentially want some recurring software revenue. So they, they ask people to sign up for a backup service. They charge them so much every month uh, and that allows them to get recurring revenue. So for security purposes, we put that first. So we put revenue second, I guess, yeah. uh, and want to keep our customers safe. So we refuse to do that. That's awesome. It's kind of focusing on compliance over growth, but also security as well for the customer. That's, that's really cool. So for you guys' wallet, though, does this have an impact on the amount of adaptability you have when it comes to providing 
the availability for certain cryptos on your platform. I, I know you guys upload about every six weeks. There's new six, you know, about six new cryptos that are, you know, put on the platform. But is this what holds you guys back from having every ERC20 token? Yeah, no, actually, that, that's a really good point. So in roughly last April, we updated the card. And with the crypto magic that we put on addition two, we can now sign for virtually every blockchain on the planet. Um, you know, we've added a feature in the card now and, and in the phone where you can add any ERC-20. So you go in, add custom contract, bring it in, any ERC-20 you want in the system. You know, in the, sis in the update coming very soon, it'll you add custom Solana, custom Aptos, custom Av, BNB. Okay. So really, you know, the product's getting to the point now where you can have just about anything you want uh, in the UI and the keys are still in your pocket keeping you safe. And I have to ask, with regulators coming at our throats at this point, as a hardware wallet company, are you guys ever planning on looking to integrate decentralized exchanges and these applications via your guys' app platform as well? Or is this more a, you guys want to follow by that compliance and make sure you guys are set up for the best possible success moving into the United States in the future? No, we absolutely support the decentralized exchange ecosystem, the DAP ecosystem. So from day one at launch, we supported Wild Connect, which allowed you to connect to your favorite decks, do whatever you want to do. We really think that's your business and nobody else's and we fully support that. So now Wallet Connect upgraded to Wallet Connect 2.0 has a lot more chains, has a lot more DEX availability, a lot more DAP availability. So we think that's fantastic, cross-chain DEX is even. So we're really excited about the DAP ecosystem and everybody controlling their own destiny with their keys in their hand. That's awesome. And, and with, you know, I wanna talk a little bit about the ethos now of Arculus, because we've spoken about this behind the scenes multiple times, and obviously anybody watching in, make sure you turn on those notifications, because on the live stream, we had Adam Lowe completely break down a lot of different uh, news articles and everything uh, just last, you know, just a few weeks ago, or whatever time you're watching this video. You know, for the Guardian, for the actual source and the actual logo of the company, what does that mean to you, and what's that underlying ethos that supports your company? Sure, so Arculus is actually the Roman god of safes and strong boxes. And that's where we pulled that inspiration from. And then from that, we created the Guardian. So the Guardian is this stalwart, personified uh, embodiment of safety and security. So the Guardian is gonna keep you safe. The Guardian is gonna take care of your assets, take care of your keys, and allow you to kind of live your best life with your digital assets. So if you were the Guardian, let's put you in this position. Let's, let's say Adam is the Guardian in this situation. And remove the Arculus, remove everything, that might be biased on what you've produced. For listeners just coming into this for the first time that are brand new to crypto, what are the three biggest things you can tell them to watch out for when looking for self-custody in this industry? Is there three red flags? Is there things that you've been through or seen that said, hey, do not touch this type of wallet? What should someone do just coming into crypto that's brand new? Sure, so the first thing is when you're brand new, you have to understand the difference between custody and self-custody, right? You can see a whole bunch of collapsed exchanges that you're essentially an unaccredited investor, you're not getting that money back. It's highly problematic. So the first thing you can do, whether it's Arculus or something else, is your keys, your crypto, get into self-custody, like period, full stop. So from there, you really need to look at a hardware wallet. And the reason is there's a lot of self-custody wallets that live on phones, so mm -hmm. it's still your keys, but they're on your phone, they've been hacked, hundreds of millions, billions at this point have been lost. So you need an independent hardware wallet where you keep your keys off your phone. So once you make that decision, you can look at, like you said, three things. One would be find one with something called a secure element. That's a secure type of chip that lives in banking cards, IDs, Arculus. Okay. Some hardware wallets use them, some don't. It's a very important distinction to keep your keys safe. The second is don't use some backup that pushes your seed phrase to the cloud because you're gonna get wrecked, right? You can find lots of examples out there yeah. that it's been highly problematic. And the third is look at the company behind it, right? So someone like Arculus, big, publicly traded, does work with large organizations that have, have high levels of scrutiny or some guy. Don't buy your hardware wallet from some guy in God knows where. Yeah. Now what's the coolest card you've made? I know maybe like you've told me about Delta planes or something that you guys took scrap metal and turned them into cards themselves? Yes, so uh, on the payment card side of the business, um, American Express came up with a great idea in concert with Delta of, you know, for their kind of highest level Delta tier, how can we make a cool card for them? Uh, we actually took panels off a of 747, turned them into aluminum for the cards, put them in the cards, produced that, 
put the exact tail number on the of the plane. I think the card sold out in like nine seconds or something. Wow! Uh, it was very very cool. We've done solid gold for Starbucks over the years. Um, we've done carbon fiber inserted uh, silver for Ferrari. We've done all sorts of cool stuff in the ten years I've been with the company. So what took you from the traditional world then, from the Ferraris, from you know all these awesome elitist clients to now crypto and finding this new black hole of an industry? What brought you there? Yeah, I mean, I think throughout my entire career, I've looked at safety and security and building products to help people stay safe and live their lives and use this cool tech, right? So years ago when I was in biotech, um, you know, I built, uh, put things in clinical trials, vaccines, again, helped keeping people safe. Then I was in defense, helping war fighters and intelligence community stay safe. Um, then we went into traditional banking, payment cards, make sure your payment card tech works, your payment card tech stays safe. Uh, and then again, going into crypto, I just saw this need to help people stay secure. And it very much aligned with my personal ethos of self-sovereignty, you know, taking care of yourself, taking care of your assets, having that independence, choice, and freedom all very much lines up with my personal ethos in life. And I just saw this great opportunity to help the space and help the space grow and leverage tech that we kind of had on hand from the banking industry. So it's a kind of weird, wavy journey, but the consistency for me is building products that help people and help people stay safe. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so what are some of the cool features that Arculus can provide that a lot of other services do not? So are you guys multi-chain? Are you guys integrating NFTs? What's the vision there moving into 2024? Sure. So we want to be kind of your DeFi Swiss Army knife, right? So safety, security, and ease of use are the pillars of Arculus. You know, while you're turning on some other hardware wallet, you'll be done with your transaction with Arculus. Uh, that and the 3FA security is super paramount. So for our our friends that have had the cards for a while, we keep upgrading, right? It's not like the, the phone mobile app stays static. So we've added all sorts of features, like almost every EVM at this point. We've added Aptos, we've added HBAR. Uh, one important feature is signing for MetaMask. So yep. a lot of people in their browser like to use MetaMask. You shouldn't keep your keys in the browser. So with Arculus now, you can actually use Arculus and sign all the transactions, but still use the UI of MetaMask. So we think that's really valuable. Uh, we've also added multi-chain NFTs, yep. uh, and really you should be able to, at this point, keep about just about anything safe with Arculus. Yeah, and let's actually dive into that 3FA a little bit. That's a term I think a lot of people aren't familiar with. That's that's going to be the security mechanism, right? So we're talking face, like bio face metrics. We're talking fingerprints. Are we talking passcodes? Yep. What does that look like, and what is 3FA itself? Sure. So 3FA is three-factor authentication. So we have that depth of defense with independent factors. So that's really important. So the first is something you are, right? So that's your biometric, whether that's phone or fingerprint, mm -hmm. uh, face, whatever's on your phone. The second is something you know, so that's your PIN. So you have a six digit PIN that's managed on the card that helps keep you safe. Uh, and then something you have, right, which is your card. So your specific card is synced to your phone. So without that, it's just not gonna work. So what's mm -hmm. really important is you leave your card somewhere or you leave it at a bar, doesn't matter. People don't know your PIN, they try to brute force it, it's gonna get wiped. I could hand you my phone, I could hand you my card. You don't know my PIN, you don't have my biometric, you're not getting into my keys. So it's impossible for, I don't know if you've seen the video of like the Phantom's Rolls Royce or the cars that get stolen because someone walks up with a giant antenna and relays the signal from like inside the house to their card. There's, that's not, is that something you're concerned with at all with Bluetooth or the tap to go with the pay or? No, so there's a couple of important things there. One, we don't use Bluetooth because while it's very convenient, it's not the most secure technology in the world. So your card actually talks to your phone over encrypted NFC. It's the okay. same type of uh, technology that's when you do tap to pay. So it's a very secure communication standard. Uh, it's purposely built so it only works you know, when you're tapping a card to the phone. There's actually encrypted communication between the two, so you can't do that man in the middle attack you saw with the card. Okay. Though that was a very cool video, I do like that video. Uh, it blew my mind away, which for anybody watching, if you have the, what, what's that called when you send that signal from your key to your car to self-start it, make sure that car is in a garage, because if it's not, it's very easy from 
what I've seen for someone just to walk up with an antenna, relay that connection, open your car and drive away. Yeah, there's better ways to do that. So what they did was called a man in the middle attack. Um, you can't do that with Arculus. So we actually have what are called session keys. I know this is getting a little technical, but essentially one time keys between the card and the phone so that the message between them is encrypted. So that could actually be prevented if they engineered that a little better. Interesting. They just don't want to do that any better. Yeah, I was like, why don't they just put, you know, these, like, the car theft is huge, and it's like you could put a lot of this on chain with, like, if, especially, like, a Rolls Royce. Like, there's only so many mates. So there's a way better way to track that, but instead they just steal the cars, they give it a new paint job, and all of a sudden it's their product, right? It's their, their car at this point. But before we hopped into this interview, there was a few things we were talking about behind the scenes. I want to know a little bit more about what you like in crypto. Obviously, you're, you love self-sovereignty. You love the hardware wall itself. But what do you look for in the crypto sector? Of course, we got Bitcoin with proof of work, but what are some of the applications that you're just most excited about? Sure, I guess given my background um, in payments, I'm really excited about things that have real use cases in payments or remittance or helping push value around the world. So I end up looking a lot of the very fast chains. So we're talking about Stellar, Solana, some of the other things with essentially real-time settlement. That's been really cool. Uh, look at tokens and chains that are very involved in liquidity. So cross-chain DEXs, things like that. So if Seller's doing cool stuff, Thor's doing cool stuff, Uniswap even is doing some yeah. pretty cool stuff. So tokens that support that, that help me change value into whatever I need uh, at that moment and be able to push that around the world instantly at very low cost, that helps so many people globally, whether it's workers trying to get money back home, whether it's people trying to travel, you know, it really, crypto and blockchain can do so much in that space, faster, cheaper, better. Um, that really will be impactful and instead of just burning it up in fees you <laughs> yeah. can actually like help people which is really exciting yeah and unfortunately i think a lot of investors heavily speculate on this market and don't realize that even though something oh it's already a massive market cap it's like well this is a project that's bringing cross-border remedy systems to allow families communicate from the united states to south africa even or some village in you know the southeast asia it's like this is a real-time settlement software that allows families to communicate more effectively and send and transfer money without all of these insane transactions and costs. Another huge trend though that has been popping up and surfacing has been something that a lot of these major major founders have been slowly jumping their or dipping their toes into, which is longevity, decentralized science. This is gonna be research for funding for research projects and scientists with Brian uh, Armstrong from Coinbase. Yep. Uh, you mentioned a little bit to me that you have quite the background in science itself. Sure. So have you seen or kept up with any of the research projects and what they're trying to build? Is this something that makes sense for the industry? What does that look like and how does crypto cross over into the world of science? Yeah, it's a really interesting idea and a really innovative way, I think, to get funding and work on ownership and things like that. So this kind of really started back in the day with Fold at Home. You know, you used to be able to like fire up, I think it was your PS3 and help fold proteins at home and do that kind of science. <laughs> I wasn't but doing that with my PS3, but. No, so it was a, it was a <laughs> long time ago, I'm dating myself. But uh, you know, it was really an innovative idea and we've kind of helped push that into crypto because uh, it's hard to get science funding. You know, I, I remember doing my PhD, writing a whole bunch of grant applications. It's very competitive and very hard to get funding. And sometimes really good ideas don't get funded. So you can essentially crowdsource science uh, and then, if appropriate, you know, help divvy up the ownership of the intellectual property behind that science. So I think it's a fantastic idea, and I'm really excited about it. You know, my background, I put a couple drugs into clinical trials. That was great. It would have been fantastic to have more funding opportunities. You know, yeah. that, that was all funded from uh, the Ludwig Institute Research for Cancer and the Cancer Research Institute. So that was really exciting at the time. Uh, I did some cool nanotech work trying to detect single base changes in DNA to, again, help look for cancer and, uh, you know, had to really fight for funding for that project. So if we could have gone to the community and say, hey, we've got a new way to take clinical samples and help screen out for cancer, I think people would have been excited about that. So, yeah. I, you know, that, but blockchain wasn't a thing at the time. Yeah. So yeah. that's just fantastic opportunities to help drive science quicker, faster, better. Yeah. And I'm all about that. Yeah. And nanotech, not nanobots, right? No, Completely no separate, nanobots. right? We're not that's injecting ourselves with little. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, honestly, I, I've seen actually some breakthroughs with that technology where they're trying to like find, like they inject you with something and it traces and tries to find like the bad, the bad cells in your body. Yeah. So the, um, so there's something called circulating tumor cells that are very hard to find. So CTCs are a very low percentage population of overall tumor cells. So if you can find nanocomposites that will essentially circulate stably, 
until they find one of those, and then they glob up, and then you can pull them out. Pull them out. Um, that's a really cool, a really cool tech that's out there. So nanotech's been around a bit, but it's uh, it's challenging. So it's going to take a while to mature. But we're Definitely. not we're not tr quite at like John Crichton novels yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and not not quite, but AI and Sam Altman people are definitely questioning things at this point, which is the advancements. But, you know, kind of moving off the research funding, though, itself, there's also a huge negativity, a negativity about the just pharmaceutical industry itself, which is going to be the IP rights of scientists. Yep. So is this also a way for scientists that not only have great ideas that maybe do get that funding, but have you personally seen or understand anything about the industry where scientists develop something and then unfortunately they don't own any of the rights to what their discovery was. So it just gets shelved, it gets pushed down, it just gets shut out, whatever may the case be from the big pharma institute that they're obviously operating under. Sure, no, that definitely happens all the time. Whether you're at university or you're at private industry, in private industry you own nothing, right? You get paid your salary, whatever that is, and the company owns your, in, your IP, which is, you know, that mm -hmm. is what it is. Uh, university depends on the university. So when, when I got my first patent, um, I was still in school. So I think I own three percent of it, something like that. School owns a good chunk, professors own a chunk, and I got a small slice. Um, and that's just kind of how it is at the time. So if you can find an independent funding source that allows you to do the science, then you can potentially more equitably split yeah. up the IP rights um, and you know that ownership incentivizes scientists to do things. I don't think a the average person understands how much money it takes to do science. You know, you'd spend tens of thousands of dollars on sterile plastic tips just to do science because that's what it takes um, you know, in the industry to develop medical, new drugs, new tech, just extremely expensive, um, extremely hard. So yeah. you know, that we need these new funding mechanisms, we need these new innovative IP rights systems to incentivize people to do this. Yeah, especially when you're trying to raise, you know, if you're trying to raise tens of thousands of dollars. This, I've seen many scientists that it takes anywhere from a year to sometimes, speaking to a quantum engineer, it took like 17 years to get the funding they were looking for in the early 2000s. I was like, and it was, it took like a, it was like a four month uh, trial that they needed to run. So it's like 17 years for four months to get the discovery they always knew was there. It's, it's kind of just, it blows your mind when you realize how much of that industry is not just, it's very simple, it's not that complex. It's just you can't get the funding to the right people. And a big part of this is gonna be, I honestly believe the centralization aspect. So seeing this open up and the decentralization scale of seeing this move to a scientist be able to communicate with China or Australia or you know Russia, uh, what is your outlook on that? Are you comfortable with science now being this more broad global topic versus what we've seen since post-war, really, of the post-Soviet Union, of the centralization of all of our medical industry. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, um, you can publish in academic papers almost anything you want, uh, but they are kind of segmented by region, and they're kind of regarded with different levels of scrutiny. So I think, you know, anytime you, science is all about openness and discovery, right? Science, good science doesn't have borders. So I, I think that's really positive. Um, and I think that open communication and scientists being able to do whatever they need to do to discover new tech, discover new solutions yeah. for medicine is extremely important because science should not be censored. Um, science should not be held back. Uh, and I think most scientists agree with me that, you know, we just want to go forth and discover uh, and the data will lead us where it leads us. Yeah, definitely. That's why everybody should discover their own hardware wallet for self-sovereignty in the link below. Adam, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on today. I appreciate you for being here as always. Uh, and of course, if anybody hasn't checked out Arculus, all the links are in the bio, but is there any way that can specifically find you, your information, do you have Medium forms, are you on Twitter, sure. uh, those type of things? Sure, you can, on the socials, hit us up at this is Arculus, and they will funnel that to me. Or if you want to get uh, in touch with me directly, Adam J. Lowe on LinkedIn is probably the best way to do it. Yeah, and if you really want to mess with them, spam whatever crypto you want to see next in the Arculus wallet a million times under anything you post. So, <laughs> Adam, thank you for coming on today. Thanks.